Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Disruptor. I am your host, Jan Almasy. Um, and actually, I am here today with another beautiful episode provided by my co-host, Mr. John Koontz. So, hey, Jan, uh, how you doing today? Not too bad, brother. We have a lot of friends here with us today. We do. We're uh, This is going to be a... The Disruptor is going to disrupt the podcast a bit today. And we are <laughs> going to, instead of having our normal... Uh, you know, Jan and I interviewing somebody, we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun, but it's also going to be a bit of an experiment. I know. And I'm super excited to, um, to just explore this topic. You know, when you first brought this up, um, the ability to be able to talk a little bit about the benefits um, for me personally, and, you know, for those listeners that have, that have been with us for a while coming from a military background and then also working in nursing and, and dealing with a lot of, um, of psychology and, and, and being inside of that space for a long time, I've really come to understand and, and really um, grasp the benefits of, of animal based therapies, right? And today we're going to be exploring a lot to do with animal based therapies, especially when it comes to horses. So um, john, I would like to just allow you to introduce, you know, a portion of our moderators, and then we'll allow the entire panel to kind of uh, give their names. Awesome. So before I do that, I just want to let everybody know that's listening that oh, that our um, our uh, show today is sponsored by the Horses and Humans Research Foundation. And as you can read on the screen, or if you can listen, I'll read. If you're listening, it's the mission is to is through sustained investment in rigorous researches research. Horses and Human Research Foundation serves a c- catalyst to advance global knowledge of horse human interaction and the impact on health and wellness. In addition, uh, the Horses and Human Research Foundation is uh, sponsoring a conference coming up uh, later this month, call, or later, in, uh, excuse me, coming up in October. It's called Connect, Learn, and Inspire, and it's a conference about research. So uh, we'll uh, flash up at later in the show notes um, some of the uh, ways that you can register and participate or even just donate. So so in the short term, uh, our goal today is to uh, get right into our, our panel discussion and we'll go from there. Those of you that are listening or those of you who are watching uh, later once we release the, the video, uh, think of this. If we were all in person, we would be in a room and we'd have a couple of panelists up on stage and a couple of moderators. And we are going to let those going to give the show over to the moderators in a second. And they're going to work with the panelists and go back and forth. You may hear a uh, interjection or two by Jan and myself, uh, but for the most part, we're going to be quiet and behind the scenes. So with no further ado, let me introduce our two uh, moderators. Our first is Pebbles. Uh, She's executive director of the Horses and Humans Research Foundation. Uh, She has uh, been there for about a year, I think. Uh, Relatively new as in that role, but has had numerous roles in the past, including a participating on our uh, or on the um, uh, uh, education committee. Uh, she has a, a master's degree from NC State and a BA from Columbia College. She has served as an associate professor and a chair of sports studies department at St. Andrews University, where she has taught study, students in the field of therapeutic horsemanship. She's also uh, an adjunct uh, professor and consultant for other higher educational institutions that focus on uh, equine-assisted studies. And then our other moderator today is Tara. Tara is the CEO and founder of the Equine Emergen Project. She has a litany of professional uh, degrees and accolades, which I will uh, we will include in the show notes. But net net, she is a licensed professional counselor and a certified clinical trauma professional. 
Uh, she graduated from Boston College with a concentration in forensic pathology and veterans behavioral health. So uh, two uh, very impressive people, and then even more impressive will be our our moder our panelists, which I will turn over to our our moderators to introduce. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pebbles Turbyville, and I'm super excited that we're here today to talk about Horses and Humans Research Foundation. And as John read our mission, um, we are basically about promoting and funding research to investigate horse and human interaction. And we have had a call for grants this year um, for $50,000 to study trauma um, and how horses help individuals through trauma. And I am no psychologist, not a therapist, um, but I have a great group here today to be able to help explain how horses can really help people in those situations. Um, our, one of our first guests is Martha McNeil. She's um, the program director. Is that right, Martha, program director? Um, basically, she does it all, I, I, honestly. Um, I follow her on Facebook, and she's everywhere doing everything. Um, for Dream Power Horsemanship in Kilgro Kilroy, California. Um, and then we also have Debbie Fisher, who is the founder of Hope for Horses Horsemanship Center in Yelm, Washington. Um, she also has a consulting um, business for people who want to start a veterans program using horses. Um, and Tara, you, you're the one who is really um, have a connection with these two as far as being able to speak the language about how horses help veterans. So I'm going to pass the ball to you. Well, hey, thanks, Pebbles and John and Jan. This is super exciting to be here. Um, tough topic, certainly, and HHRF really decided to um, have this year be the year of trauma, um, not only for uh, veterans and, and current events is this a timely thing, but collectively I would say that we've all experienced some trauma this year, um, whether it's with our teenagers, adult parents, whatever we've all been going through with work, um, very, very difficult year. So. I think this is a real appropriate conversation and topic and kind of a new twist on how um, another alternative complementary modality could really support healing. So, you know, we often hear go to therapy, um, but as I've worked in hospitals or in my private practice, no one has ever taken a selfie with me sitting on my couch after a session. <laughs> People have typically, though, when they come out to the farm and spend a day with the horse, they're taking pictures with the horse. It works. So let's take a deep dive into why and what that even means and why research is so important um, supporting that so that we can really get move the needle forward and not just say, you know, music therapy works, art therapy works, yoga works. We really want to show how equine therapy works. So we've got two great people. You don't need to hear from me much, but uh, Martha and Debbie, we'd love to hear from you a little bit about your stories. Debbie, you have an incredible story about why you do this work. If maybe you could just kind of share with the listeners a little bit about that. And, um, you know, I think it, it really gives credence and authenticity to, to how important this is. Thank you, Tara. It is really important having the right heart reason why to help veterans. A little bit of background information about me is that I am actually a gold star military widow. My late husband, Colonel Fisher, served 28 years in the military. I have two children that also served in the military. Um, my daughter is an Air Force pilot and my son's a Marine that served in Iraq and Afghanistan. My late husband was killed while on active duty in 2006. And after being married for 30 years, uh, it was very devastating to me. And one of the things that I did personally for myself, uh, we actually had his commander uh, go ahead and work with the family since we lost Randy uh, for 30 days. And one of the things that I did every single day for that 30 days was to take his commander. I says, the only thing I can do right now is I need to be with my horse. And I said, you're just going to have to come with me. I'm going to put you on a horse but I have to be with my horse because I just was very numb and just couldn't 
couldn't really function, but my horse is something that brought me back to being able to feel. In 2009, one of my late husband's um, uh, fellow workers uh, there in the military who had post-traumatic stress told me about a program called NARA, which was North American Riding for Handicap at that time, their national conference down in Texas. And I went down to um, Texas and I listened to a panel of veterans tell me how horses had literally kept them from committing suicide and given their lives back. I was I just in awe. I was tears coming down my eyes. I got to talk to the men afterwards and they told me in no uncertain terms to go back to the Washington State and start a program for veterans. And it was pretty amazing how God just opened up the doors I already had seven horses of my own at that point in time. One thing that was a little bit funny is my late husband, one of his horses was actually a trained police horse and also a jousting horse for the Seattle Knights. And I sold that horse three times. And that horse, I would tell the new owner, I said, if it doesn't work out, you just let me know and I'll buy him back. Well, I bought back the horse three times. So I knew God had something in mind for Root Beer and I, and it definitely was uh, equine therapy with veterans. Thanks so much, Debbie. You know, it, it is really interesting on um, what brought you here was trauma of your own and how we, we label it post-traumatic stress disorder. However, in the industry, we're really dropping the dig. I loved how you called it post-traumatic stress. And even on that, because it's a natural, normal, healthy reaction to a terrible incident. Even more, I think what we're learning in equine therapy is that it's really post-traumatic growth. And that's what we're seeing with the horses, is, is that it's, it's not a stress disorder. And how do you learn and live a quality life with growth? So maybe Martha, you know, as a licensed marriage and family therapist, if I pitch it on over to you, what, do you, what are you seeing and experiencing out there in California? Well, um, can I first tell how I got into the field oh, just please. because I want to? Uh, um, so my brother was actually a colonel in the Air Force, and, um, and he was a career officer also. And my dad was a lieutenant in the Air Force. And so um, I got interested in working with veterans because of their commitment to their people that they worked with. And so I talked with my brother at great length about his, the responsibility he felt for his airmen. And, um, and that kind of got me more interested in working with the veterans in our community. So we started in 2009, we started working with OEF, OIF veterans who were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And now um, we've been working with veterans, I guess, for 11 years. And we work with veterans of all eras, all ages, all branches, uh, men and women. And um, so we have now we have three weekly support groups for veterans, which are equine assisted support groups. And so we have two for um, mixed gender groups and then one specifically for female veterans. And these groups meet weekly and they come to the ranch. And one of the things that we've heard from many people is that it's hard to get veterans who are at home out of their houses to come to therapy that um, it's difficult. And so one of the things that we have found with the horses is that it's motivational, that one of the, the good qualities about horses is they motivate people to come. Like they like the horses. We meet at a ranch, we meet outdoors at a ranch. We don't have any buildings. We meet outdoors in the sun or, or the shade or rain or whatever. And the vets tell us they love being outdoors. So they love being with the animals and they love being outdoors in an open environment. Many of them tell us it's peaceful here. Like this is the only place that I can relax. I'm not looking on rooftops. I'm not looking for, for you know, an ambush. I can relax out here. It's calm. It's peaceful. We got birds. We got owls. We got quail. We got horses snorting and kicking and doing their horse things. And it's just a very relaxing pastoral environment. And that encourages vets to come. And the other thing I would just add is that we want our farm or our ranch to be a resource for them. It's a community for them. So veterans are invited to come anytime when they need to stop by. And oftentimes they will stop by to see their horse. They're on their way to the VA. They're on their way to a difficult appointment or whatever, or they're coming home from a difficult appointment. And they'll just pop by to see their horse, hang out with their horse for a little bit, have a little communion time, and, um, and then kind of regroup and then go on their day. So 
Um, what we're trying to do is to do long-term work with veterans, just become a part of their long-term support network. And, and we've had vets get married, vets have kids, you know, they move cross country, we stay in touch with them. So um, it's just, it, we want to become a part of their family, a part of their support network. And our horses are really the motivation that makes them come back. They're not coming back for us necessarily, they're coming back for the horses. You know, Martha, that's such a good point. Um, so a lot of uh, people after um, being separated from the military say they missed that community, right? And have a really hard time reconnecting. So what we see in uh, trauma specifically, or even in any type of transition in life, is sometimes you disconnect from yourself, from others, from your community, from, you know, your family, from, you know, a higher purpose and meaning. So you're right that, you know, people ask all the time, why horses? You know, why not a llama farm or a snake farm or, you know, what is it? And you're right that it might be difficult to tell your story or get in touch with your story, um, but you're able to connect to a horse first, which gets you grounded in that, that time and space and then a place and then a farm family and then your own community. So, you know, Jan, when you, when you returned, you know, um, and, and you've served in the Air Force uh, National Guard, did you miss that kind of that camaraderie and community? Was that something you experienced? Oh, most definitely. So <clears throat> when I, um, when I got out of the, uh, the Air National Guard, it was definitely, it was an interesting decision because I would, I turned down captain's bars to leave. Um, I felt in my gut that, you know, actually the whole reason why we're sitting here today, um, was a calling of mine that I was experiencing that was not allowing me to sign that promotion paperwork, um, with good conscience because I felt like I was being pulled to start a business. Right. And so I was like, okay, cool. I have a purpose when I leave the military. So I'm not going to be like those, you know, the veterans that leave and, you know, struggle and can't find purpose and everything else. And was I wrong? You know, like leaving and taking that uniform off, I think regardless of whether you were a guard, whether you have never been deployed, whether you've been deployed five times, um, comes with a sense of identity loss and a loss of higher purpose, right? And then um, dealing with that, um, actually a lot of uh, the the work that I saw at a place called Whispering Grace locally here in Canton, Ohio, where I'm located, um, got me really interested in in a lot of um, the equine therapies because they were saying that, you know, veterans were coming in and and the conversations that they were afraid to have with the therapist or that they didn't want to have with anybody else they were having with the horses. You know, and the horse, the horses would always listen. And I, I talked to a couple of the veterans that were at the location when I was working with Whispering Grace and. Um, and I've never, I haven't personally experienced the equine therapy. I grew up on a farm, so I've been around horses a lot. So I, I understand the connection, but they, I, I remember talking to one veteran specifically that said that, um, that the horse, uh, listened to him more than anybody ever has in their, his entire life. And then he keeps coming back over and over again, helps clean out the stalls, helps, you know, do everything, um, just to, to feel that intimate connection and then has the ability to ground himself and have conversations with other people. But I think that that, that transition out of the military, no matter what type of branch, you know, we, we seem to be very air force heavy in here, um, fly high, aim high, fly, fight, win. Right. Um, but no matter what, regardless of branch, regardless of deployment capability, you take that uniform off and there is going to be a transition period. And I think that this is a beautiful way, um, to be able to assist in that transition. You know, yeah, it's so funny. You're right. All of us experience, you know, the veterans come, they, they connect with the horse and then they want to work, right? They want to do things like cleaning mm -hmm. stalls, fix and fences because they are so motivated and mission oriented. Like Martha said, getting outdoors when they're, they're cleaning store stalls. I thought, God, how can I kind of pitch this as a good thing? Oh, it's aromatherapy. Yeah, that's it. This is aromatherapy. <laughs> come on into the barn. Bed neck CrossFit. Let's do this, you know. But we really want to get back to like the science of it. why does it work? You know, why is HHRF, Horses and Humans Research Foundation, is so invested in rigorous research to, to say, you know, what is happening? You know, it's great for us to talk about great stories of so and so saved their life because of Buddy the Horse. 
but we need to prove the efficacy to, to stand strong in, as this uh, modality. You know, so if I can pitch it over a little bit to some of the research, um, Debbie, you guys did an incredible study with Baylor. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Can I talk a little bit about what that research was and, and what those outcomes were? Right. Well, this is something that is very important. Horses Humans uh, Research Foundation is the, the foundation that went ahead and funded this grant for this research project. It was the very first research project in regards to post-traumatic stress and what horses can play into that part. We're seeing an over a 50% reduction, over 50% in post-traumatic stress symptoms within eight weeks of working with horses. And this is just even on the ground. It doesn't even have to do with the riding. The horse is the key here. And I am just so grateful for the horses, humans, um, Research Foundation for having that money available. It's so important that we continue. I've been doing internal research since I began 11 years uh, ago to validate to our community, to everyone, that this is a viable uh, program that we can use for our veterans. And the one thing that I try to encourage everybody to understand, too, is that it's complementary. We're not trying to get rid of traditional therapies. We are very complimentary, and I have a lot of physicians and nurse case managers when they know that they have uh, one of our veterans in the program, and the the veteran comes in for their appointment, and they just don't even want to do anything at all in that appointment, and the doctor can say, well, how's your horse doing, or, you know, and even say the name of the horse, and then all of a sudden, that veteran will just open up and start talking, so I think that we are very complimentary. Same thing with family members. I have had veterans where their family members are still back at their duty station and they've all come here to Joint Base Lewis and McCord and they've been here for years, literally two to three years. And of course, when they call the, up on the phone, the last thing that they want to do is, well, hey, dear, how was your doctor's appointment? Or, you know, we have these bills to pay. But the family member can say, I saw you on Facebook working with your horse. And that was just absolutely amazing. And then it just, the communication lines where we are, it's such a ripple effect equine therapy can have. And, but we just need to convince the, uh, country that this is something worthwhile to pay for because like Martha and I both know we do everything by uh, fundraising to raise money horses are expensive um, and I'm never ever going to charge a veteran because they have given paid the price already and I just think it's very very important that this program continue always to be free for our veterans. Debbie such a good point about families so you're right the families are also You know that. We all see that. We all hear it. And so sometimes, you know, healing can actually, we can slip in there. And, you know, a grandfather who served in Vietnam isn't going to disappoint his 12-year-old granddaughter who wants to come out to the horse farm for a day at the farm. So it is kind of a sneak attack in there of how we can really engage. And then healing becomes kind of a family conversation. Um, so it's healing without actually labeling it as therapy. You're, that's so important. And Martha, I see you shaking your head, absolutely agreeing. Can you speak a little bit on that, on how you kind of get people engaged and, and what, what the horse does for that? Well, the, the, the story that came into my head, Tara, was um, we had a mom who was deployed, I think, three times to Iraq. And she had two little boys at home. And when she finally came home to stay, she sent us the most beautiful letter about what it had meant to her to have her children in our um, Horses for Warriors program while she was deployed because they would send her photos there of her of their kids riding. She would have conversations when she could call home. They told her about their horse. They told her about what they were doing at the barn. And she said it was the first time that it wasn't just tears and when are you going to come home, mom? And she felt like her kids really had a support system at home and that being deployed, that gave her this incredible peace in her heart, knowing that the community was supporting her kids and that um, the community was helping to really surround her little boys with love and support while she was over there serving. And it it makes me tear up thinking about it because it was really a beautiful moment. But we took care of that family until they moved out of the area. Um, When after mom came home, we continued to do work with mom and the kids. Um, 
we've had many families where we have, you know, vets who come and bring their kid with them. Uh, my kid needs community service hours. Can she clean stalls while I'm here in group? Absolutely. Oh, my wife wants to come. Cool. So we've had spousal support groups through the years off and on. Um, but we try to involve adult children, um, little kids, parents, siblings, everybody. We involve the whole family. And we have a lot of what we call family days at the ranch where we, that's our recruiting tool, is we invite the veterans and their families to come in order to get the kids and the spouses hooked. And then they make the vet come because the vet sometimes is a little reluctant, but if their kids or their wife wants to come, they'll come. So we use the families as a part of the motivational tool as well. And we're providing a real healing service to them, helping them. The other thing that, that I just want to say is that what we learned from our vets is that many times when they were coming home from combat, they had real difficulty connecting with their children and their spouses again. And they had difficulty talking with them and difficulty having improving those relationships. And so by having the horse to talk about, we had one wife that told us you know, after he comes back from the barn, he won't shut up for two hours. All he wants to do is talk about his horse. And that really helped that family um, to improve their communication just because dad was at the ranch and he was so excited about his horse. He came home and he wanted to talk when ordinarily he really was pretty withdrawn and didn't want to talk in the beginning. And that horse provided a bridge for communication that then sort of spilled over into other areas of life. Oh, Mark, but that's so great to hear. And I think that's happening all over the country. You're absolutely right that, you know, it is giving something what we call positive and corrective emotional experiences. Right. So you have this wonderful thing to be able to talk about that's exciting and normalized instead of, you know, gosh, yeah, I had to go for, you know, a back appointment or, you know, a, a brain injury appointment or hearing loss. So, yeah, you're absolutely right that it is something that's kind of normalized and, and you know, real positive. But maybe what we should do for, for the listeners is kind of like rewind a little bit and actually even explain what happens, because there might kind of be, you know, are they only cleaning stalls? They keep hearing about that. So let's let's back up a little bit and say like what a typical thing might be. There's there's equine assisted services has many buckets. Um, one is called groundwork, so that means you're not doing any riding or anything. And and we'll let either one of you kind of talk about that. Another one is therapeutic riding, where you're actually um, on top of a horse doing all different types of experiences, uh, you know, walk, trot, turn, stop, and really finding, you know, how to hold the reins of, of the horse as well as your life. There's some that might be carriage driving. So you might be on top of, um, you know, sitting in the back of the carriage, you know, kind of those old buggies that you see, you hook it up and, you know, really learn how to connect and communicate with a horse by carriage driving. Um, and vaulting, that's actually gymnastics on a moving horse. That's a really wild experience. You can see a picture here of somebody actually in a saddle, but no hands, just really that trust. So, you know, Debbie and Martha, why don't I let you guys kind of talk back and forth a little bit about what actually equine assisted services even are and what you guys offer. Well, I'll talk about um, our horsemanship. The only therapists that we do have at our place are the horses. And even though we keep the veterans on the ground for the first eight weeks before they go into the riding, and a big part of the reason that we do that is that a horse being a prey animal is a lot like a veteran that has post-traumatic stress. And they're always at that state of hypervigilance, uh, looking for around for what the danger is. And the other thing that they do is uh, whoever, whoever is a part of their herd they're going to be paying attention. So in a horse's world, the more eyes and ears that are paying attention out in the pasture, the safer they're going to be keeping that cougar from jumping on their back and eating them. And when we partner up a veteran with a horse, um, they'll stay with that very same horse the entire time. And the thing that's really great about this is now that that person is a part of that horse's herd. And that horse is going to, whatever uh, is going on inside the veteran, say, for instance, there's quite a bit of high anxiety. The horse is going to be very, very nervous and hard to work with. It's going to be fidgety looking around because as far as they're concerned, that veteran is telling them there's danger around here somewhere and I'd better be ready to run away from that danger. And so what's really great is that's immediate biofeedback for that veteran on really what's going on with them. They, many of them have been at this state of hypervigilance for a long time. They think it's their new normal. 
and it's not normal, and that horse is going to call them on it. I just love our horses because they are the best lie detectors. These men and women come to our program, and they can they just look really normal to begin with, but that horse is going to tell you the truth, what's really going on inside, whether their heart is racing or their blood pressure is up. And so if that horse is very fidgety, it's hard to work with. They need to learn how to become the leader for that horse. And so by doing this on the ground to begin with is much safer. It's also been a very uh, positive thing for my horses. Horses that do the same thing over and over and over again have a tendency to burn out very quickly. And by having them learn how to become the leader for the horse, it makes it easier to work with the horse. Plus, my horses stay in the program longer, too, which is really great. Um, the one thing, uh, Jan, that I just really appreciate you guys is you're all adrenaline, adrenaline junkies at heart. And so what I'm doing is just teaching horsemanship skills. And like you saw in the, that last picture, you know, these veterans were walking over that 30-foot balance beam that was 18 inches wide with no hands, of course, a long time before I ever even tried it. Uh, so I just really appreciate being able to work with these men and women and uh, give them that new adrenaline rush that is a whole lot safer than uh, what they were used to do. Um, Tara, I can tell you about our program. So we, we offer groundwork, um, which most of what we actually do is on the ground now. We also have carriage driving and we also do have horseback riding. Um, right now, we don't have any veterans that are riding because of physical injuries. So we have had so many vets with back injuries, knees, ankles, just all cut shoulders. And so we haven't been able to do as much riding as we used to because um, they're just in the middle of putting their bodies back together after their service. So it's been, it's been difficult with the riding, but the carriage driving allows people to do more, um, more work with the horses than they can do mounted. So we do have vets who are doing carriage driving right now. We have a ton of groundwork happening, which I find is is every bit as satisfying. When our when we first started, we had um, young vets who were just back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they were all jacked up, and all they wanted to do was get on a horse and run. And so we worked with that for a little bit, and that was okay. But now that group of vets, in our experience, is getting older, and their injuries are catching up with them. And so now they're going back to the VA for back surgery and for knee surgery. And so now they're actually happy to be on the ground working with the horse. Um, so we can accommodate people in wheelchairs. We can accommodate, you know, people on crutches. We can accommodate anybody to work with the horses. We have miniature horses who work with our vets if um, we feel like it's not safe to have a big horse around. And um, so we're very flexible, very accommodating. But most of our work at the moment happens on the ground. The next group happens in a carriage. And then um, we have a few vets who are still riding, but but right now not a whole lot. But we're flexible and we go back and forth with the equine activities because the horse is the constant. And then what the activity looks like just depends on the needs of the individual person at this time in their life. That Can I jump in for a second, Martha? I wanted to just, you brought up a point. I just want to emphasize it. And that's around carriage driving. Because what carriage driving does is it opens up the opportunity to just about everyone. You can be, you know, quadriplegic, a paraplegic, you can have, you know, you can have limbs missing, you can be blind, you can whatever. And you can experience the the equine excitement, if you will, uh, behind the uh, on a carriage. I mean, the ones I've worked with, we actually fit the wheelchairs right in, we lock them in. If they have use of their arms, we let them drive the carriage uh, with an instructor. So the, the, the point I just wanted to bring up is that the beauty is, is it's sort of the gamut, right? From ground to carriage to uh, on, on the horse um, sort of opens up an opportunity for whatever your uh, disability might be, whether it be cognitive or, um, or physical, if you will. The other thing that I want to add on that, driving is actually a, a very high adrenaline rush um, discipline in the horse world that can be very, very dangerous. So it actually is very attractive to our veterans. We have six driving horses in our program. And the same thing, uh, if you've watched the Olympics this year and what they did with those horses, it's, it's, it really can be a good adrenaline rush for these veterans. 
You know, you're right, is there is a sense of what does it feel like to feel competent and to feel confident? So competent and confident. And so, you know, we, we label it as adrenaline rush and we want to re kind of program that into, you know, how do we feel alive? How do we feel awake? And I think that's a lot of what horses do. They send that feedback of, I've got your back if you've got my back. You know, if you walk into a field to catch me and, and you're not connected, we're, I'm going to run away. You know, it's kind of like your kids or, or your puppy. You know, so you're right that there is that sense of you're so in the moment of whether you're you're working with the horse and leading it on the ground or you are in a carriage and trotting around pretty fast. You're always in the moment. And when we're doing the research, if we if we really bring it back to, you know, HHRF and the research is showing specifically that that self-confidence, that, that social engagement, that emotional regulation that we're looking for. So you can get yourself kind of that, that high feeling of I'm doing something really amazing, yet I'm safe and I'm feeling alive. So maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, what that feels like, you know, um, and how sustained it is. Because we don't want people to have this mountaintop experience for 30 minutes and then not have the impact last for six to eight weeks or months. So the research that we're, we're looking at with HHRF is really the effects on equine assisted services with PTS. Um, you know, could either one of you kind of speak on that, Pebbles or, yep. or Debbie? Or... Well, I like, like to talk about coping skills. The horses actually really do teach the veterans new coping skills that they can take out to the rest of their life. And so it starts with that immediate biofeedback. I hear my veterans a lot of times say that you know, the, the, being there at class, uh, it, it, being in the moment really helps a lot. And it'll last maybe one day, two days, bring it out a little bit further. Like you said, we want to see these coping skills actually carry over into their rest of their life. And I really do honestly think that the horse does do that. I've had veterans tell me that they've gone ahead and gone into Walmart and um, there's got to be too many people in the store. And then they just thought, okay, what did I do to calm Fred back down? And they applied those same techniques at being there in the middle of that store with all those people and we're able to get out to keep a control of the situation and everything goes very well and so this just sort of broadens opens those doors instead of isolating back at home they can actually start functioning again in our communities which is very powerful and we've proven it there's the no, that's the point absolutely is is that you know you see in the moment maybe what an eight-week session does and then you see the impact of now i'm actually applying those skills you know so in therapy they're learning a lot of things you know cognitive behavior therapy or prolonged exposure therapy or all these validated you know um therapeutic approaches to healing and what the horses do is they give you that visceral back in your body kind of reminder of I experienced this I remember that and now I will do this so you're absolutely right Debbie that you know that is just it, it's fascinating right and it's so exciting so you're right like where do we then go with that how do we measure it how do we you know get that qualitative number stuff how do we get the the or excuse me the quantitative numbers and the qualitative impact studies and so that's kind of the exciting challenge that we're all facing in this industry is is to validate those outcomes do you have any numbers or or anything that you could kind of you said, you know, 50%, 70%, you know, what are you seeing with outcomes, like specifically, whether it's coping strategies or um, emotional regulation? Do you have any numbers you could throw out there for the audience? Some of the internal uh, things that we're actually tracking are anxiety, uh, detachment, pain, irritation, fatigue, uh, their energy level, and also insomnia. And in 2018, uh, for anxiety, we are seeing a 42%. Um, decrease in uh, detachment it was a 39 percent decrease in their net pain it was only 18 but think about it they're actually doing physical therapy in a really cool setting and so I see men and women um, move from wheelchairs to walkers to um, using um, 
canes very, very quickly, probably a lot faster than traditional therapies because, of course, when you're grooming a horse and, and using that horse for that stability instead of those other items. Um, irritation, uh, irritability uh, went down 36%. Uh, the fatigue actually went down 21%. Their energy actually went up 21%. And insomnia was 0 0.06. Uh, and so, and then that was for 2018, 2019, the scores even got better uh, with the anxiety uh, reduced by 51%. Uh, their detachment was 40, 46% and um, so on. And so the thing that I like to tell uh, on the consulting side when I have people that want to go ahead and start programs uh, with veterans in equine therapy is that they really need to do be doing internal research. There's multiple reasons why to do it. One might be for the fundraising part to validate why people in the community need to support your program because of the results that you're getting right there at your center. Um, and then also, um, it's just really important for everyone um, to see uh, in regards to that it doesn't matter. It's the horse is the key here. Uh, Martha can be doing thing her program maybe a little bit differently than I do, but we're all getting the same results. And the uh, Baylor Research Project sh showed that. We went ahead and we had um, four centers using uh, my published curriculum. So we're all using the same curriculum and uh, in different parts of the country, and we all got the same result. Um, the recent Missouri uh, research project, same thing. They just did, had a writing program going. They didn't even do the groundwork. But here again, the same thing. It was the horse that is the commonality that we're seeing the same uh, results on and helping these men and women, which is just simply amazing. And then, to the fact that I have so many of the men and women that actually start decreasing the medications that they're taking uh, because they don't need them anymore, which is just simply wonderful. So we will put a, a link to that yeah. Baylor research uh, study in our show notes. Um, that And I believe that was the one that was funded by uh, HHRF, uh, amongst others. I'll put that one out later. Yeah, Debbie's really good about um, highlighting um, the three different studies that HHRF has funded on veterans. So um, I really appreciate that little shout out for HHRF. And, and Tara, can I point out why we need more of this kind of research? So it's really difficult to do research on anything involving psychotherapy, because especially when um, people are getting treatments in multiple places. So if you're getting treatment at the barn and at the VA and other places, it's very difficult to tease that all out. So one of the reasons that we need HHRF to fund scientific research about our veterans is to get a clean study that can demonstrate what's actually happening um, specifically to this treatment because it's just really difficult when to try to tease it all out and we need funding to help scientists get it straightened out because it's really hard to do in the field without that kind of support and we need a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really interesting. I think hopefully the audience and listeners are really tuned in to the incredible impact this has. And, and if it's something that you're familiar with and you've been around animals, hopefully this we're speaking your language. If you've never touched a horse or been around it, hopefully you're hearing that there are other resources out there. You know, HHRF and um, equine therapy is not only for veterans. You know, historically veterans and, and military really have paved the way with you know, whether it was shell shock or amputations or, or scientific breakthroughs, because it was a large measurable community. Like you're saying, you know, here's this pool of, of people that we can really do research with to move medicine ahead. Um, but I, HHR has funded stuff for autism, for cerebral palsy, at-risk youth. Pebble, I, could you tell a little bit more about, you know, this is the year of trauma, but it's pretty incredible the far-reaching effects with um, autism, cerebral palsy, that's even really exciting. You know, we'll come back to that, but veterans are, are brothers and sisters who have lots of deep things that are going on, and, and maybe we talk a little bit about equine assisted services 
there? Uh, well, you know, we've spent or or have six hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. That's over a half a million dollars we've already used in research and different um, grants for research in different areas. And you were hitting on a lot of them. We've done four in autism, three in cerebral palsy, three in veterans, two in youth, um, one with post-traumatic stress disorder, but it wasn't with veterans, it was non-veterans, and one on innovative use of technology. So we've done a variety of research. Um, and, you know, the thing is, it's so, it's so exciting when you're having this conversation and we're talking about how research helps veterans or helps people with trauma by utilizing the horse. Um, it's just the questions keep coming up. Why? And why, why is this working? Or how can we investigate this more? Or how can we prove this more? Why is this going this way? And really, all we need are dollars just to back up that why, because the more money we have, the more money we can do in research. You know, it's just like Martha was saying with, you know, why is research work? Um, why is, why are veterans, you know, we know this, but why are veterans um, succeeding at the farm rather than maybe in a different type of therapy? Could we compare that or what's the difference, um, which we know that's kind of the horse, but what are the other elements that are helping them be successful? Or maybe it's not a horse, maybe it's something else. And why is it? And, you know, that question of why, but with that why, you always have to have the dollar amount to help with that funding. So yeah, let me jump in for a second, Pebbles. And, and, and just sort of the way I see it in, 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 as I travel around, it's we all have this, and you guys have done a great job of giving us sort of the, 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 the visible, I'll call it the visible evidence, right? The, the, what we see and what we observe. Um, and what I've been hearing from people I talk to is that's great, but it's you do have to, as you mentioned, have to raise money and, and, and pay for your services. And one way to do that is to support what all the good work you do by some, some science or some research. And obviously then the way you do that is you have to find an organization that can fund that research. So it's sort of this great ecosystem, right? So we try to raise money. We then... I, we, we put a call for grants out uh, to, to submit the, the research. We, we fund it. The research is then published, and then it flows down to organizations such as yours so that you can use it in your work, either to make provide better services to your constituents or, just as important, use it to help uh, raise or do your own fundraising. So I see this as a sort of a, an ecosystem that keeps going around and around and around. Right. Uh, like um, Debbie had mentioned the Baylor uh, universe, um, study, Baylor University study by Beth Lanning, uh, that's been cited nine times in other research. So not only did she provide us research, she's also doing a foundation or setting a foundation for other people to do research. And um, that also has been read over a thousand times um, that we can track, that we've actually physically tracked. Um, and the same thing on a different note was the, the effects of therapeutic riding on uh, stress levels in the young adults with autism spectrum disorder that was done at Slippery Rock University by uh, Dr. McKinning. Kinning. Um, basically, that's been read 18,000 times as a reference, people have read it 18,000 times. So we are not only providing that money for research, but we're also providing it that's helping others do research. So it's a stepping, a huge stepping stone or stepping blocks. I, I think of it as a rippling effect, which is really great mm -hmm. um, here with the research part, but also with our veterans. If we reach out and help our veterans, we have a rippling effect that we can have not only with the families, but with the community, with the entire nation and even the world. 
And a lot of times people don't realize, you know, how how profound effect we can have if we do help our veterans. And I just, being a, a military wife and traveling all over the world in the 28 years that Randy served, I know what it's like to live in other parts of the world. And we owe these veterans everything for this wonderful place that we have to live here. You know, that's such a good point. Um, all over the world, horses are all over the world, right? So people might not have access to, you know, um, high level universities or medical centers. However, you know, horses have been our partners for thousands of years. They helped build our cities. They carried us into war. They've, you know, um, helped plow our fields. So we've had this human horse interaction or, or bond. And now to be able to partner in, in another way and, and, and really explore why, you know, it just wasn't that long ago that they helped us go, you know, into the store to down the street um, before cars. So Jan, you know, if we kind of, you know, bring it back to, you said you grew up on a farm and, um, you know, your, your understanding of this, you know, kind of as uh, both a veteran and as an ICU nurse, um, you know, in, during a pandemic, you know, what do you think your listeners need to hear from us that, that kind of gets them the buy-in or, or helps them really understand what this could be? Um, so if I was thinking, you know, talking to <clears throat> more of the, the scientific piece, or at least maybe a mixture of the scientific piece and maybe some anthropological, some anthropological conversation is like you were just saying, um, you know, horses have been our partners for thousands of years. You know, you don't interact with the same animal or the same type of plant or the same human, you know, you don't interact with something over thousands of years and not have your neurology rewire itself in a way that forms a bond with that thing. You know, that we, we talk all the time about deep brainstem functions and, and parts of our nervous system that we start to kind of lose consciousness of, because our consciousness is really only a small portion of, of what our brain is actually processing on a daily basis. And if you start to think about what that subconscious does when you interact with an animal, especially an animal that has been a part of the human race's you know, journey on this earth for such a long period of time, that intimate connection is, is an amazing thing. And growing up on a farm, you know, I – there was something to be said about um, taking care of that animal, you know, feeling that responsibility to something other than yourself gives you purpose. Um, and, and that's a beautiful thing because it, it, it meaning is so hard to, to find, you know, when you, when you get disrupted, no pun intended for the pod, you know, <laughs> when you get disrupted in life and you're thrown off track, you know, and whether it's as simple as, you know, as simple of a situation as mine, which was just taking off the uniform at the beginning of the pandemic, or somebody that has been on multiple extremely difficult deployments and has seen, you know, friends pass away and has seen a lot of, you know, traumatic stuff come back. You're still for that person, regardless of what scale they experience that identity loss, they still experience the identity loss. And so for that person, that individualized experience is still a feeling of lack of meaning, you know? And so for all of my nurses out there that are dealing with PT, like the, the, the negative situations that have happened because of COVID, with all of the pressure that has come from working at the hospitals, with all of the, um, I, I, I could spend an hour just talking about what it was like working in, in the ICUs um, during COVID. It's the closest thing that I've seen to kind of military-esque um, exposure, like the, the the volume of traumatic experiences that people are being exposed to in the hospital systems is um, if you're listening to this and you are a healthcare professional, understand that just because it is our calling or our vocation to care for others does not mean that it is not okay for you to care for yourself. Um, it's a great point. It's, it's, it's something that I've battled for a long time. It's something that between being in the military and nursing, you know, I have a servant's heart. I think that my choices and career path kind of show that. And a lot of times we have difficulty, um, admitting or not even admitting we have difficulty acknowledging that we have an empty gas tank, 
because we believe that there's so many other people that are relying on us to have a full gas tank that, you know, we're not willing to have that conversation with ourselves. So, um, maybe you don't need to have that conversation with yourself. You don't need to have that conversation with another person. Maybe you just need to have that conversation with a horse. Yeah. Well, and Jan, that's a great point because what I've learned or noticed or observed over the years was when you are working with a, a very, very large animal and all of a sudden you have a responsibility to take care of it, just, even if it's just a, to groom it or to saddle it or bridle it or take it out to, you know, to the pasture or to the paddock or to feed it or whatever, very simple things, you all of a sudden stop focusing on what what's important to you but you start focusing on what's important to to the animal Mm. and it could be the same with dogs and i'm sure other animals but i think the size the mere size of the horse also has a great impact um and i think you guys alluded to a lot of that and so much on why we spend time on ground work first I will tell you, I was not a very good rider, but I was really good at cleaning out stalls and curry combing horses. And, you know, I could win the saddle derbies and things like that. But uh, so it's just I, I think you're, you're onto a good point. It's this this we've and one of the reasons I wanted all you folks on the Disruptor podcast was because we've we have had a year of disruption, not only in physical and mental disruption through uh, the, through the pandemic, but certainly when my world and the technology world, it's we're we're seeing extreme uh, digital disruption and experience disruption, and so I think I wanted to spend some time just grounding us back onto how to how to how to cope with some of that and how to how to help help the world, if you will, at the end of the day. You know, Jan, um, I just wanted to address what you were talking about with first responders. Um, I know that um, there's actually been some research being implemented already um, about first responders and how um, equine assisted services have been helping first responders and um, not only just the research, but I think that it's a great program that has started out of disruption um, in the sense that um, firefighters, EMTs, nurses, doctors, all that have been on the front lines of this COVID um, have had an opportunity to at some facilities because a lot of our equine assisted services centers actually had to close down uh, due to COVID Um, Some of them even went out of business just because they didn't have other funding resources. Um, Some had to look at alternative um, revenue streams. But one, they decided, you know what, we really need to offer this service to our frontline responders, which are, you know, the medical service. So from that, it kind of, it offered a service, but then um, some international program started doing some research with it about how it actually helped those responders with their stress um, and trauma themselves. Pebbles, yeah, that's, I wanted, that's so cool. That's awesome. Pebbles, I wanted to share with you, um, I actually have got a first responders uh, group starting over in Spokane, Washington. Um, first responders have always been on my heart ever since even when I first started this 11 years ago. But I've been stayed so busy with veterans that I didn't have time for that. But on the consulting side, you know, um, not only, you know, do we have this first responder center starting over in Spokane, but we've also got uh, another program starting over in the Philippines for the active duty army over there. I've also got something going on over in Jordan uh, with the uh, refugee children from Syria. You know, it just it, horses are absolutely amazing at helping us heal. I can't say enough about that. So, yes. You know, Jan, yeah, Debbie, it's incredible. You're right. So, Jan, what you were talking about is is what is even trauma? And I think a lot of people might say to themselves, you know, I didn't have some horrific incident or this, this, you know, one thing, you know, that really did it. And what we're really seeing is sustained cumulative trauma. 
You know, even if it's taking care of a six month old, a four year old and a 10 year old who you're trying to teach from home while maintain a job, while do any of that, what does all of a sudden, you know, this, this continuum of trauma look like? So you're right. Absolutely. You know, sometimes we think of trauma as just a one time, you know, an IED blew up my Humvee. Or is it being separated from my family um, because I'm doing, you know, long shifts at the hospital? Or is it, you know, I can't relate because, you know, I've had to have 15 really difficult calls as a, a firefighter or a teacher who, you know, is scared or whatever it might be. And, and, you know, for some people, you know, a splinter can really ruin their day and other people, you know, an amputation is that, ah, okay, I'll figure it out acknowledge where you are, you know, really just whatever you're experiencing is valid and real. And Jan, you have such a good point. Whoever you are and, and whatever you're experiencing, take that time to do that self inventory. You know, am I okay? Because I've got to make sure everybody else is okay. Um, so I think that that's kind of what our work does, you know, with um, getting yourself grounded enough and a horse keeps you real. You can then, start to heal yourself, which then has that ripple effect. You know, Martha, as a licensed marriage family therapist, are you seeing that ripple effect with families and communities out by you? Oh, Martha, you're on mute. Take yourself off mute there. We want to hear from you. All right, as soon as we figure out those technical difficulties, you know, so when we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the, the concept of trauma and the concept of kind of sustained stress, um, you know, horses have been, there's been research that showed that cortisol levels um, decrease. So you measure the cortisol level of the human by you know, swabbing inside their mouth and you measure actually the cortisol level of the horse and both are matching as decreasing. We talk about heart rate variability. You know, when we're really anxious and upset, our hearts, you know, really are dealing with a lot of that stress. And what we've done is we've done research where, um, you know, a heart monitors on the human and on the horse. And you start to mirror, kind of like when you're hanging out with a friend and you're both real chill and relaxed. You start to kind of do the same, like cross your legs at the same time or scratch your head at the same time. And you're like, what was that? That's what horses do is you start to really start to slow your respirations because they breathe slower respirations per minute with us. Their heart rate's slower. Their temperature is warmer. So, you know, that, that stress response of feeling colder and, and your blood not flowing as well. So, so the, the, that's what we're talking about with the biofeedback. And that can be for anyone, whether it's children at risk, autism, cerebral palsy, all of those benefits. Um, Jan, I think you have a really, really good point there of what is that horse connection? And you said, you know, a little bit about anyone who is struggling right now, who do they reach out to? Um, we'd love to be a clearinghouse for that, Horses and Humans Research Foundation, and have a place for you to explore those options. You know, what do you think your listeners would need to hear of, of you know, where do we even go to find out more about this? Well, for you guys, um, for are you asking like resources as far as like my connections with Whispering Grace and then talking to you guys or? Yeah. Do you think your listeners would want to know, you know, a few of um, the, the large organizations that really do kind of work with HHRF or maybe Pebbles, are you the one to answer that, you know, partners that we do on the animal connection? Oh yeah. My, my listeners would 110% benefit from that because when it comes to, um, you know, the listener demographic, it's, it's a lot of, of first responders and medical staff and military when it comes to um, the listenership, just by the nature of my jobs and, you know, over the course of building the show. So, you know, for everybody listening, pay attention to what's about to be said, because it's going to be some cool resources for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, the, the pressure's on. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Um, I know. Well, one of the things is with HHRF, I mean, we are a resource. So that um, for really research, but we also um, promote those um, centers who have been accredited um, by PATH, which is the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship uh, International. Um, but we also support other centers that do other types of programs that might be a gala or E3A 
Um, I'm trying to think of other ones, Tara, that you, that you might know of. Yeah, so those are the acronyms, right? Military gets, you know, that we're it, doing an acronym. So, <laughs> again, PATH, that's the Professional Association for Therapeutic Horsemanship. And they have all types of certified uh, therapeutic riding, carriage driving. I'm an equine specialist in mental health learning. I know Martha is a certified riding instructor. Um, another one is EGALA that uh, Pebbles just mentioned. That stands for E-A-G-A-L-M, Equine Assisted Growth and Learning Association. Again, that's Equine Assisted Growth and Learning Association. Um, that one is on um, the ground with a therapist, um, and they do really good work right. on helping people in groups heal. Um, some other organizations, E3A, that's a really fun one. That's, um, oh gosh, that's a mouthful for me. Equine Educational Experiential. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you got it right. There you go. So they do really neat, like corporate um, team building. So maybe you guys had, um, you know, someone maybe lost their life in COVID or a, a event that you want to really empower your employees after, you know, being home and now coming back together. E3A is a great organization to get through some of that. Um, so, you know, the, Debbie and Martha are also, also really involved in a lot of other organizations, um, but we want to just throw out a few of their, those for you guys. One, one big one that I do want to point out, because sometimes we kind of think, you know, just in our own little United States or North America, but really what, what we're talking about is international and HETI, H-E-T-I, which is the Federation of Horses and Education and Therapy International. Um, they um, also support research. Um, they just had a virtual, what was actually a hybrid uh, Congress in Seoul, Korea. And that's where I actually learned, Jan, about the research that was being pre um, done on first responders in equine assisted services. Um, I was surprised at how many centers were actually doing research in that area. But um, HETI is a is a great um, group of or organization that is also helping us um, with research, and it's international. So great. Hey, let me just jump in for a second, just to let you know. We will put all of these links uh, in the show notes. Um, one of the things we. Jan and I do as part of the Disruptor podcast is it's we try to democratize this information. So it will be sent out to all of the participants, to Debbie and Tara and Martha and Pebbles and and be utilized as they see fit of whether it be on their YouTube channel or on their Facebook page or things like that. So we will have links to all of that and a little more detail on each of, of the of the four uh two moderators and the two panelists. So just, just, uh, don't, 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 those of you that are trying to write all this down, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get you covered. Okay. You know, I think it's a great what point. What we're hearing today is what's so exciting about all of this is, is that we are coming from a place that healing is a collaboration, not a competition. You know, all of us have different ways of healing or doing things. And as long as we're all collaborating and supporting each other, you know, getting the information out to each other, that, that's what this is about. You know, and that's what the disruptor seems to be about is, you know, come up with these really cool ideas. What's going on for you? You know, make it real. Pay it, pay it on. If horses aren't for you, it might be for somebody that you know, your neighbor or something. So I think the disruptor is such a cool experiment and an experience, you know, for your listeners to kind of access these really amazing um, opportunities to learn. And, and we're just having fun talking about, you know, trauma. What's wrong with us? <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the reasons we started this podcast was uh, Jan and I got talking about just the whole world of, and again, from a technology background, the, the sort of this technical or digital disruption, and it's really sort of moved into a, I'll call it an experience disruption. And, and, and it's sort of our tagline is, you know, are you a blockbuster or are you Netflix? You know, are you the taxi cab industry or are you Uber or Lyft? Either way, you are being disrupted, whether you 
and then you throw on top of it a you know a global pandemic and every human being on this planet has gone through some sort of disruption over the last you know 18 months or more um, and so what we try to do is give people insights on how to deal with disruption how to either become a disruptor by offering new and unique approaches, sort of why we wanted to have you guys on this show. Or if you are being disrupted, how do you, from a business standpoint, how do you survive? How do you, you know, not go out of business? Or from a human perspective, how do you just cope with the, any sort of disruption that you might have, whether it be a, a, a trauma disruption or a cognitive disruption or, or just you're, you know, you're trying to deal with your business. It's, you know, you're the taxi cab driver and Uber's coming in and cleaning your clock. So that's sort of the whole goal of, 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 of this show and sort of why we put it together. Yeah. You know, when you got inspired by, uh, or, or even accepted maybe kind of the invitation or the, the pressure <laughs> to let us all come on here, you know, and do a new thing where, you know, here's a bunch of ladies talking about horses. You know, I, I think it was really brave of you. You had no idea what we would really present with. So <laughs> thank you so much for taking the risk. Um, yeah. You know, we really appreciate it. And, you know, is there something that you could think that maybe your audience might want to ask Debbie or ask Pebbles or me, you know, or, or Martha? Um, anything that you think would be really curious or, or quirky that maybe we're not addressing? Honestly, I think the majority of the points that my audience would be super interested in, we've been really, really good about hitting. You know, they, the recaps that I think are really the coolest are just the pretty much universal applicability of it when it comes to any type of emotional stress, chronic stress, or PTS. Um, also, I think it's really beneficial for my audience to know that the D is dropping off of PTS. I thought that was super interesting, you know, even being inside of still working with um, child and behavioral adolescent, I wasn't aware that the D was dropping off of that, of that diagnosis, or at least that that's where the trend is kind of pushing, you know, and I wholeheartedly understand and agree with where that's going, you know. For for people to understand, if they take nothing away from this episode at all, that that post traumatic stress is a normal response to extremely traumatic events, you know, or chronically, um, and I won't even say extremely traumatic events. Just you know, like you said earlier, Tara, um, sometimes chronically low stress events over a longer period of time, or a disruption in the daily life cycle, trying to manage three kids at home while having a job and everything else like that. Don't, you know, if you're listening to this, don't look at it as, oh, everybody else is dealing with it. So my feelings must be invalidated because there's no way nobody else is feeling this. Right. You have those types of situations, validate yourself to yourself. And, and sometimes an animal is a really, really good way to bring that all together. So I think it was, it was a beautiful conversation about the transparency and the vulnerability that comes with understanding that post-traumatic stress is a normal human response to either like acute extremes amounts of stress or chronic low amounts of stress, that your feelings are validated and that there are a community of people that are out there not only advocating for you, but also attempting to prove the efficacy of why they're advocating for you. And I think that's extremely powerful for the scientific community to hear and understand. You know, you're so right. You know, as a trauma counselor myself, um, you know, I can go eight, 10 hours, you know, with, with incidents that are uh, current affairs right now and um, just hearing and holding space for a lot of really hard things. And I have to check myself all the time and say, mm. gosh, you know, how, how can I keep giving, you know, and whether that's preparing, you know, meals for your elderly parent that's at home or whatever you are doing to hold that space for yourself and check that, you know, what is it? And I will just sometimes have 15 minutes between sessions and walk out to a horse and just be. And so, you know, not just saying, gosh, this is really great for veterans or really great for, you know, the law enforcement or firefighters that I work with, but for myself. You know, so, so I'm already drinking the Kool-Aid and hopefully your audience is able to kind of step back and say, you know, what am I doing? Am I scheduling 15 minutes, whatever it might be, you know, go sit out in the grass, 
to, you know, have a glass of water, you know, take a walk around, whatever I might need to do, um, you know, check in with a friend or find something good that is going on. There's a lot of good in the world. So, yeah. you know, just be, you- I think it, that's in a very important phrase that you just mentioned there. Just be ground yourself, be in your body, just be. Yeah, like, we're human doings, drive that home. We're not human doings. And we are just always doing doing. So be a human Amen. being for a little while. You know, Martha, I know you had some kind of um, technical issues, but we really want to give you a chance to um, go on back to, you know, give, give a little voice to what you've heard today and, and how that being and being on the farm really works. Yeah, I apologize. I am on a farm and my internet connection like it. So I apologize for that. But um, I just wanted to, to a family member, if you're a provider, if you're a healthcare provider, there's a place for you at a program near you. And um, the horses love to help. They really do. They love people. They love to help. And we would just welcome you to come and explore a program in your area because all of us um, who are speaking for the field now, would welcome you to come and check out a program in your area for veterans or for, for anybody who's struggling right now, just connect with somebody local and see how the horses can help. Um, I know we focused a lot about veterans, but Martha, you've done a lot of other um, work with, with people with trauma or different populations. Can you talk about that, about that? Yeah. So we've been working for um, 20 years now with children in foster care and children who are in out-of-home placements and have experienced a lot of trauma. And we work with a lot of young people involved in the juvenile justice system, um, gang-affiliated kids. And so all of those children and youth have experienced a tremendous amount of trauma. And we've been working with them at the barn with the horses for 20 years. And um, it, it's a marvelous thing for young people. And it's really good for people who challenge authority, like our gang-affiliated kids, And so the horse really helps them um, pay attention to the therapist and learn about authority a little bit when you put them next to a thousand pound animal. Um, So if you're a therapist, you know, working, having the horse on your side as part of your team is great. Um, And it really helps those kids realize that they don't run the world because the horse is bigger than they are. So, yeah, we've done a ton of work with kids and youth with all kinds of trauma and um, and it's been extremely effective, and uh, I'm grateful to have the horse as a part of my therapy team. Debbie, do you have any stories that you could share a little bit about, you know, just kind of what actually is happening and, and something that really touched your heart or, or, you know, why you think that the funding for this research is so important? Oh, I have so many stories, but I, I do have a couple I'd love to share with you. Um, I had one general, uh, an airman, he was actually a loadmaster in the Air Force that came to our program, and he was a career military man and um, totally broken. And when he first came through the door, he could hardly even look me in the eye. Uh, it was just really uh, profoundly sad at the state that he was in this very hollow shell of a man. And he started working with a horse by the name of Abby and he didn't want his photo taken, nothing. Uh, He just, you know, leave me alone and went to the horse and progressed. And as time progressed, he just absolutely blossomed. And not only did he learn his horsemanship skills and actually even learn how to ride other horses, um, but he actually competed in extreme mountain trail. And that was the one where we saw the picture of him up there on the balance beam, um, riding that horse with no hands and the partnership that he developed. And it's just absolutely amazing. Um, these men and women, they're, they're worth saving. Uh, I'm just so proud um, to have the honor of being able to serve uh, with these men and women and give them their lives back again. And so Richard is, uh, like uh, Martha had mentioned, we stay in contact with these men and women as the years go by, and they love to come back to the farm for vacations even. And Richard was actually here this last summer. He now lives in Arizona. And so it was just so nice to see him again. And these horses really do remember their veterans. And that's one thing I think that really surprised me is how our horses have lots and lots of veterans. 
and how they actually even remember them. Another one was uh, Kathleen Steele. Jan, you had mentioned in regards to, uh, I have a huge uh, percentage of my veterans that come through my program that are either medics or physicians or that type of thing. Uh, it's probably over 50%. And Buddy, um, this is a Missouri Fox Trotter here that you see in the picture. And Kathleen was a major in the Army and she was a, a nurse, an operating nurse, and she had just seen way, way too much. And it just, for her, she'd come out to the farm and she'd see Buddy and, you know, it really was helping her. That immediate biofeedback on where she was at really made a difference in her life. And it would, you know, last for, you know, the day and then it would last for a couple days. And then she would notice that she'd have a drop off, but then she would look forward to coming out and seeing Buddy. Her granddaughter was diagnosed with cancer and um, she actually passed away. And Kathleen, one day, she says, I just can't do it anymore. Um, and actually had a, uh, her, a revolver in her mouth and was going to pull the trigger. And then all of a sudden, it just was like a picture in her head was Buddy. And she just knew that Buddy needed her. These horses do, they depend upon us so much. I think when military men and women lose um, their purpose in life, uh, these horses give them their purpose back. And even if it's not something that they're going to stay with a long time, whatever that heart's desire is, that horse actually helps them feel that what that heart's desire is again so that they can go ahead and pursue it. And so Kathleen, I have had so many veterans tell me that their horses have kept them from committing suicide. It's just... It's very humbling, and, and, and you really realize how important this work is uh, for our men and women. Yeah. So, um, I think you those great stories. Part. You're absolutely right. You know, that's yeah. tapping into a whole nother part of, of, of what people are suffering with. And if we stop pathologizing, right. And putting it into the medical industry of, is it social? Is it emotional? Is it physical? Um, really sometimes we're talking about spiritual injury, right? Of that, that loss of just meaning and purpose and what are my values and, and what is happening in the world? Is the world a safe and good place? So, so clinically we call that moral injury. Um, but to get away from that, what, what, what that really even means is, is can I trust? Am I worthy of love? You know, am I, can I give love? And so something that may be so hard to do with another human because maybe you've been betrayed or, or, you know, have lost that, that connection to is the world safe and good? Are, are people worthy of that trust? You know, horses can really give you that spiritual connection again. So I think sometimes what we, we talk around because research, it's really, really hard to prove that type of thing. However, now really the industry is partnering with pastoral care. You know, many hospitals, I, I work with Mass General Hospital all the time, and, um, you know, they have as part of their program pastoral care that do rounds with the doctors. So, you know, is spiritual healing, is prayer, is it whatever you believe in, are you nourishing, you know, that sense of, of you know, what keeps you going? And it could be uh, as simple as, buddy, the horse needs me. And so I think that is some of the life-saving stuff that we see, really difficult to measure, and that's why HHRF is looking at it beyond even just rigorous quantitative research of, you know, 21% of this, or, you know, is this a significant impact of, do you feel better? And the applied sciences and the, you know, single case design, those have legitimate um, you know, modalities to be able to offer in the research community. So Tara, 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 we talk a lot about moral injury in our program because we see moral injury as the, the, the most distressing thing that most veterans deal with. Um, and I, and one of the things that we've learned in the research about moral injury is that one of the ways that helps veterans and others overcome that is volunteering. And volunteering in the community gives you a sense of purpose. And so volunteering at the farm is a part of our treatment program for our veterans. And I could just give you an example of that. We had a young man who had come back from Iraq and um, 
he was the most withdrawn, closed down veteran I'd ever met. He, he would not talk about anything. And I didn't know his story. I didn't know anything about him. But we had a group of kids coming out to the farm and we invited the veterans to come out for this work project and help these kids. And so this guy said he wanted to come. I said, great. So that night, um, I started getting messages on the farm answering machine. And about once an hour through the entire night, this young man kept calling and saying, I'm going to be late, but I'll be there in the morning. And an hour later, there's a message. I'm going to be late, but I'll be there in the morning. And then like every hour through the night, this veteran was saying, I'm going to be late, but I'll be there in the morning. And I knew that he was having a super hard night. I knew that he was probably suicidal, but he showed up at the ranch in the morning late and he looked terrible. He looked like he death warmed over. And I asked him, I said, do you want to talk? He goes, no. I go, all right, well then go out there and, and help these kids um, paint a fence. So they did. We never talked about it. But about a year later, I got an email from him, a, a book, where he explained what was going on that night. And he said, you know, I had a gun there. I was drinking. I couldn't get the pictures out of my head. But I knew if I could hold on through the night, I would be at the ranch in the morning. And, and he said, you know, that's what got me through the night. And that young man now has graduated college. He has a great career. But it was going to the farm to volunteer. He said, I told you I'd be there. And I was going to be there because I told you I'd be there. So that's just an example of how volunteering can help veterans have a purpose and um, and just get through the night, get to the morning, and then everything gets better after that. That's an incredible impact. And those are the real stories. You are absolutely Right. Um, hopefully hearing these stories kind of after hearing the research and, and you know, um, this leaves you with with that that calling maybe to get involved with us. You know, look up H HRF, look up Horses and Humans Research Foundation, send people our way, look up Debbie, look up Martha, look up my program, Equine Immersion Project, whatever we can do in all parts of the country, you know, Washington, California, Ohio, you know, we're all over. Um, and we want to be here to serve those who have served and to help you, you know, um, get the word out. So, John, I'll kick it on back to you and Jan. And thank you so much for allowing this space for us to be able to, um, you know, spread the word. I'm on mute. So that's great. Um, yeah, this has been a, a fantastic conversation, and I uh, want to really put a shout out and a thank you for our sponsor, uh, the Horses and Human Research Foundation, and in particular uh, to their uh, Connect, Learn, and Inspire conference, which is, is coming up uh, October 30th and October 31st. Hopefully, you'll be listening to this before the conference, but either if you don't, there's certainly opportunities to get involved Um with, with HHRF. Also want to give a, a quick plug to, uh, to our, our, um, our panelists. Uh, and let me go find it in particular, um, Debbie's book, uh, which is called, uh, stopping veteran suicides with horses, a promising approach to PTSD. And we're going to drop the D, uh, you're gonna have to get, you're gonna have to have another, uh, edition published, um, but it's, uh, I know most of us have either read it or had used it to prep for this, this podcast. Um, and so it's, uh, I always like to plug uh, anybody that has a book uh, and I will plug uh, Martha's uh, organization as well as Debbie's uh, in, in the show notes. So with that said, uh, let me stop sharing. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jan for some other, uh, oh, one last thing I wanted to plug uh this actually, I'm going to plug for our next show. So we've talked uh, the next one of the, it may not be the exact next disruptor segment, but one of our segments on the books to be recorded in the future is sort of another way to, to deal with uh, with uh, disruption, whether it be again digital disruption or cognitive or mental or just whatever disruption. And so we are going to be interviewing uh, an author of another book uh, called. Um, the Art of Stopping by, and it happens to be a relative of mine, David uh, Kuntz. And so uh, it's another, we'll look forward to, uh, we'll be recording that uh, in the near future. So Jan, with that, uh, we're 
actually an hour and almost 45 minutes, I think, into this. So uh, I'll give you the last word. All right. Well, first of all, you know, this is a um, something that we love doing new things when it comes to the disruptor, or it comes to Apex Communications Network in general. And so being able to be a part of a panel, um, especially around something that is so early on um, in um, – you know, diving into the the tangibility of the scientific research and hearing all of these amazing things coming from counseling perspectives and therapeutic perspectives and equine perspectives. And I mean, it's just been an amazing journey being able to be a part of this conversation. Um, so I'd like to express my gratitude to everybody um, for stopping by today and, you know, and allowing us to have the, the, the ability to facilitate this. Um, and then for everybody that's listening, <clears throat> you know, throughout this entire episode, um, I think if there's one thing that I've, I've really been able to glean is that there's a community of people that cares, you know, uh, if you are one of these people, um, and I'd say these people as in I'm one of them, you know, if you are a person, the only qualification that you need in order to be okay with relying on somebody else to help you through a situation is being human. You know, being human means where we are a social creature we have been from pretty much the time that we formed civilizations, you know, and they are finding out that that happened earlier and earlier. It seems like every year they're uncovering some new civilization that they found that, you know, takes us back another thousand years. So we've been together for a very long time and for a very long period of that time, horses have been a part of that life. So I would challenge anybody that is listening to this and kind of got their curiosity spike to go to these resource websites and to interact with these people's brands and really dive deeper into what this research means. Because I think that you'll be pleasantly surprised that it's not just a bunch of woo woo stuff, you know, that there is a lot of scientific evidence behind it and that it is backed and that it is beneficial to all of these people. So that would be my final call to action to the audience. And, you know, until next time, I hope that you guys stay curious, you keep challenging the norms, and you keep chasing your apex. And keep being disruptors. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon, guys. Have a great rest of your days.